All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Janela Pasquale. I'm a front-end developer at Perfect Memory. And uh, one of my main responsibilities is um, ensuring that users and users have a coherent visual experience. So how do I implement that with CSS and end-to-end -end tests? So first off, most of our applications, they pass through what we call a software development lifecycle, which consists of several steps. So the objective of these steps is to ensure that we deliver high quality products. And we as developers, we play an important role in the testing and integration stage to ensure that our cycle is continuous and um, is smooth. So, um, we have several types of tests at our disposal, but the three major ones are our unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests. So here's a testing pyramid. Uh, has anyone of you ever encountered this, this model? <laughs> OK. So a testing pyramid, uh, it represents the ideal ratio of our volume of, num of tests so if you see the pyramid, there's layers. Each layer has a type of test we ideally like. So first off, at the base of the pyramid, we have our unit tests. So our unit tests, they test our uh, database models, our services, our helpers, our base components. And th these are the tiniest logical blocks of our application. So they also lay the groundwork of our application, so it is important that we have a lot more tests for this. It will also serve as a good groundwork for our higher level tests, for example, integration and end-to-end -end tests. They are super fast, they are less costly to maintain, and um, uh, there's yeah, they're super fast and they're less costly to maintain. However, they're too abstract for end users, and having them will not guarantee that our application will compile. Next off, we have our integration tests. In integration tests, they test our higher level components. So an example of a higher level component would be uh, an auto-completion form. For a unit would be our, a search input, a user inputs uh, a search query, and our in integration test will be testing that their input uh, shows uh, or displays our list of suggestions correctly. So as you can see, um, integration tests have more dependencies. So they're a bit slower and uh, a bit harder to maintain than unit tests. And then right on top are end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end um, -end tests would require us to launch a browser and which connects to a test server. Um, and um, um, sorry. Um, so our end-to-end -end test would require us to uh, build and launch s uh, most of these bulky dependencies, um, but which, uh, sorry, <laughs> but, sorry. Oh yeah, but this is a very good tool for, for Agile because it will allow us to validate an entire user story. Are you familiar with uh, who here uh, uses Agile at their work? Okay, so user story. <laughs> so our user story. Um, an example of a user story, for example, we have, we have an application called My Books. Yeah, this example will come up later. So My Books, so for example, we have users, they could log in, they could search for a book, and then they'll be able to add these books to, to their reading list. Um, End-to-end -end test will allow us to test the u this entire user scenario, as opposed to integration, which will just focus on, say, just searching or logging in. However, end-to-end um, -end tests uh, we only like write a little because they're quite known to be very slow and hard to maintain. As we've seen, we have to, as I've explained, we have to launch a browser and uh, build a, s a test server, and that contributes to to end-to-end -end test being uh, really costly to maintain. So ideally, you would like to have just a little. So as we notice, um, as we move up the pyramid, uh, the tests are slower and harder to maintain. But what's important is that our tests also become more relevant for our test user, for our 
and uh, for our users. So it is um, important to have end-to-end -end tests on top also. Um, the pyramid might give an idea that end-to-end -end tests aren't imp important, but actually um, um, it plays a vital role because this is the only way we could um, validate that our application is working, which unfortunately our integration tests and unit tests won't be able to, to do. So the bottom, they're faster and easier to write, a bit slower and costly in the end-to-end -end tests, but they're less abstract as we go up. So, all right, so end-to-end -end tests are still important investment, but they bring in co um, a cost. But we have to understand why end-to-end uh, -end tests are known to be brittle. Um, most of, uh, it mostly, it's mostly due to the, the fact that browser events are, are asynchronous in nature. So for example, when you launch your app, usually there's a time of uh, a time you need to wait. We wait for our external libraries to, to load. We have to wait for our page to be to render. Even the fact of loading a video or an image, or sometimes there are pages where one part is loaded and the other part loads separately. So these are the reasons why there's um, end-to-end -end tests can be a bit uh, difficult to, to predict. There's also, this, um, there's also this problem with browsers behaving differently. Um, one time at work, we were testing, uh, we were trying to put end-to-end -end tests in our workflow. So it came into two steps. Uh, I tried to test, to write uh, all of our end-to-end -end tests on Chrome to, to stabilize it, to see, to get a feel of um, how end-to-end -end tests would, uh, would work with our application. All right, all tests are passing, great. And then when I tried it on Firefox, I noticed that the tests were really slow and 60% uh, were failing. So at first I didn't understand why, and upon further analysis, I, I, I saw that the solution should be to explicitly tell the browser to wait for this element to load, this element to load, this element to load. Before, um, when, when our tools were less advanced, most of our end-to-end -end tests would have explicit uh, would have magic numbers in our weights, so we'd put browser wait 300 seconds or or 30 seconds, sorry, not 300 seconds, 30 seconds, and all that. So despite these drawbacks, end-to-end uh, -end tests are still important because it's the only way to to test a complete user scenario. It's important for for agile. Also, this question of um, manual tests. Imagine if you have a team of manual testers and uh, we have to, to test for Chrome or Firefox. So at work, we have 200, um, around 200 end-to-end -end tests and that would take us about um, eight minutes to run. And to write 10 end-to-end -end tests, it took us about a day, which is compared to um, there's a library at work where we have 4,000 unit tests and it only takes us 20 seconds to run. And it can take us, um, I know, 20, 30 tests in just a few hours. So imagine like for, for, for a machine to run automated tests, end-to-end -end tests, it takes us eight minutes for one browser. Imagine having a human tester test 200 tests for one browser and having to repeat that to another browser. So we could see that there's still a, um, uh, a good investment in having to automate them. And then lastly, we do not want our bugs to appear in production. We, we do not want our, test, uh, our, our users to be testing our apps. So how would we remedy the fact that end-to-end -end tests, while still important, will make it less painful for developers to to maintain? Well, one good thing to have in mind is that to accept that tests are also part of our code base. So oftentimes, developer would set aside um, good coding convention, pardon, sorry, uh, good <laughs> coding conventions because we don't consider tests as, our, as part of our actual application code. But also remember that tests are here for quality, so it is not unreasonable to expect that we have um, to write high quality tests. 
So over at work, um, most of our front-end uh, applications are developed on Angular. So Projector comes out of the box, and this is what we use. So it's been a year since I've been uh, writing n tests, and I'm happy that um, just recently we've established our tests. So I, I managed to solve some of the problems with um, Firefox being really um, difficult to, to test with. So now we've integrated it in our CI, and it runs uh, every day. And then uh, we see, like, uh, we have it run 4 a.m. in the morning. So when we get to work, we can see if some of the tests have failed or from our previous build, from the pre from a build of the previous day. So I'd like to to give a tutorial, uh, a, a short workflow, a short walkthrough on how we ideally um, we'd uh, we'd approach it at work. So going back to our application, the MyBooks application earlier. So this is our user journey. For example, okay, a user logs in. Second part, there's our search bar where we can type the, the name of our book. And then our results will come up. And then we have our our possibility to add it to our, to our reading list. So most of you are probably familiar with the the syntax as a user, etc., and the BDD syntax. So, for example, given that a logged-in user has nothing in his reading list, user searches for life, the universe, and everything, and that is to his reading list. I really like. Uh, well, I, I read the th first book uh, about six times. <laughs> this one about two times. And then, life, the universe, and everything should be in his reading list. Fortunately, we can't. Uh, See it, same the prob I had the same problem. So basically, how it implemented in Protractor is, um, as we see, there's a there's a parallelism with our given syntax. So given scenario reading list, given that our user has logged in, when the user um, searches for a book. So here we actually have our describe saying, adding from search page. We send um, we send a search life, the universe, and everything. We explicitly tell our browser to wait until results come, and then our assertion would be it should display the added title and the reading list. So if you see, it's a bit verbo verbose. This one is a is a selector to select the, the elements of the of the the app, which we can interact here. For example, here a login form we can send our, our the keys of a test user, and then we explicitly tell the browser to to wait for for the login to be successful. So if you see that it's all ver verbose and um, it's still lacking some of the good coding conventions we've been uh, aiming for. So my suggestion would be to to refactor with page objects. So it's a it's a good pattern to to use because it applies separation of concerns. It avoids repetitive code, especially if you're going to test multiple scenarios of logging in. You do not want to repeat the the the, the code earlier, so you, you essentially put that in a class, and also it allows for easier maintenance because if ever your CSS selectors have changed, you would just have to change it in one place. And finally, it sounds more meaningful and more natural. And your spec file and your spec files actually look like a real spec file. So an example of a page object, so there's a class, like a normal class, normal TypeScript class. There's login, one for search page. In, lo in login, we'd, uh, we'd have a function called start and login, where we get the home page, um, input our test user, and click on the login button. We've also modulized the elements as a property of the page. And the and what's also nice to have, what we do is we have our helper, cl helper class where we put all our functions that are more or less related to end-to-end -end tests. And our uh, example of our function that we've moved is to, is to wait until the results come up. So here I've, I've written that we explicitly wait until the item count is greater than zero. Or wait until uh, an element is present. This one I use a lot in our, in our tests. So how would we, so how would it look like uh, implemented with page objects? So essentially, at the start, 
we'd like to list all of our dependencies so in one place. We could see at a glance what are the dependencies of our of our test. We could see that the reading list scenario has login, search page, the nav board to show the reading list, and of course our helper. We initialize all that in our setup function. There's our login page start and login. So we all the noise of the uh, technical stuff have been uh, moved elsewhere. And the second part is this. So if you see, it's, it really reads like a, a spec file. So adding from search page, where you search for the title, wait for the search results. Add result first, I abstracted it with the index of the, the result. So the first result. Um, we open the reading list and then we expect that the first item of the reading list, the title, it equals uh, like the universe and everything. So uh, just a few, f a few tips before I, I end this talk. Um, first, uh, aim to push tests further down the pyramid when possible. That means if a test can be uh, tested in unit test, uh, and you've tested it in the end-to-end -end test or integration test. If it's possible to push it to the unit test, uh, the better. Um, there is no need for test functionalities. That way, that that means like if you've wanted to test uh, email validation, uh, if you've tested it in the unit test or integration test, there's no need to test it again in the end-to-end -end tests. If you have to test it again in the end-to-end -end test, because even if the unit tests were passing and you saw that in the interface, the end to end tests have failed, it's probably uh, a code smell. And last but not the least, um, we know that end to end tests are very costly. So, to better um, optimize our efforts, we would apply the 80 20 rule or the Pareto principle. So, what it essentially means for end to end tests, 80% um, of our critical functionality are found in 20% of our modules. So what I suggest is to list down 20% of the of the most commonly used scenario by your users and focus all of your efforts in testing that. So thank you for listening. That's all.